from Romans 8, beginning in verse 12. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Please be seated and may the Lord bless the reading and the preaching of his word to the growth and grace of his people. Last week we saw and discussed what it means to live a spirit-filled life. And we saw that the spirit-filled life is not the uh, experience of just a few super spiritual elite Christians or those who are gifted with certain uh, extravagant spiritual gifts. Rather, Paul says in verse 9, if you do not have the spirit of Christ, then you don't belong to Christ. So if you are a Christian this morning, you have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. And that means that we should expect all manner of things to be true of you and of your life. That means there is no condemnation for you if you are in Christ Jesus and the Holy Spirit dwells in you. God cannot condemn you because Jesus was condemned in your place. It means you're set free from the power of sin and death. And that means you're no longer enslaved to your sin under the old written code, but are liberated to live your life to God's glory by his Holy Spirit. So obedience is not and should not be a burden to you. It is not about meeting some external standard that God puts on your shoulders. Rather, the new life of the Spirit is one in which you are transformed from one degree of glory to another, from one degree of faith to another, from one degree of sanctification to another. And and this transformation begins with your mind, with your mindset, as Paul writes in Romans 12, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So the spirit-filled life shows itself in a particular mindset that reveals its way and it reveals itself out in the fruit that our life bears. So while the body is dead because of sin, because we live in this present evil age under Adam, the spirit is life because of righteousness. And so our spirits, our souls, are alive in Christ, as Paul will write in 2 Corinthians 5. If anyone is in Christ, behold, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and the new has come. And if we were to stop right there, oh, what a joy that would be to be part of God's new creation, to be free from the condemnation and the power of the sin, to have the Spirit dwelling in us, equipping us to live a fruitful and joyful life and loving life. But no, it doesn't stop there. Because Paul goes on in these verses to tell us that the Holy Spirit is also the spirit of adoption. And thus, everyone who is led by the Spirit of God is also a son of God. The gospel, therefore, makes us more than just servants of God. We're more than just debtors to God's mercy. We are sons and heirs of the Father. Jesus is our big brother, not just our Savior. We're part of his family, members of the household of God. So as John wrote 
But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And so we are. We are not only just forgiven. We are not only just released from condemnation and the pains of hell. The gospel not only frees us from sin, it elevates us to God's side. It makes us his beloved children. It makes you a beloved child of God. Now let's work out what this means in Romans 8, 12 through 17. First, we see that we are adopted through the Spirit as sons. Second, we are adopted through the Spirit as heirs. And third, we are adopted through the Spirit into the family business. So first, we are adopted as sons. This is the middle section. This is the linchpin of Paul's whole argument in this paragraph. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Now, I want to begin by asking the simple question, why does Paul only mention sons here? Now, you may have the NIV, you may have another translation that says sons and daughters, but the NASV and the ESV are correct. Paul only says all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Why doesn't he say sons and daughters, and does it really matter? Well, first, in the Greco-Roman world, women had very few rights. Women were often treated just above a slave in terms of social standing and legal status. They were not viewed as responsible persons in themselves, but were viewed in relation to the authoritative man figure in their life, either their father or their husband. Did you know that in the Greco-Roman world, women could not testify in court? They could not legally represent themselves in any way, shape, or form. They were not able to inherit the property and the estate or even just a portion of it, from their fathers. All those rights and privileges were reserved for men. So when Paul writes, all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God, what Paul is doing is he is actually elevating the women of the Christian church to equal standing with the men of the church. If he were to say in that day and time, you were all sons and daughters, then the women and men of the church would heard, okay, the gospel retains this Greco-Roman social standing. It would have left women in a second-class citizenship position. And so what we read today as marginalizing women is actually the opposite. Paul is elevating the women, by saying that they too are sons of God. In the parallel passage of Galatians 3, 26 through 28, Paul follows the statement, you are all sons of God, with the statement, there is no male nor female. Now, I'm not going to get into this. It's not eradicating all sexual distinctions or responsibility differences between, and men, between men and women. But here's the point. Unlike the Old Covenant, where the sign of circumcision, the sign of being admitted into the covenant, belonged to men only, and where inheritance rights were primarily through the men, in the New Covenant, in the New Testament, women are fully recognized, fully right-bearing, Members of the household of God. Whereas men in the old covenant were the only ones who received the covenant sign, men and women received baptism. Whereas it was through the line of a man that the promises of Abraham came to the next generation, 
in us and in Christ, all receive the promises of God as yes and amen. So that's the first answer. There's also a second answer. And I think this is the main answer. Because we need to ask, how and why do we become God's sons in the first place? Are we adopted based on our gender, on our identity, on our worth? Are we adopted based on what we have to offer God? No. We're only adopted in and through Jesus Christ. And who is he? Jesus is the Son of God. His title and his status becomes ours by virtue of our union with him, by faith and through the Spirit. The only reason, therefore, that you and I can be called sons of God is, at all is because Jesus is the Son of God. And who he is before the Father is who I am before the Father. It's who you are before the Father. We are clothed in Christ. And so the main reason, Paul says, all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God is not because of who we are, it's because of who Jesus is. And in Christ, male or female, Jew or Greek, barbarian or civilized person, we are all sons of God. We are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, we can apply this. What, is, what does it mean to say that we're sons? Where are the practical implications here? Well, Paul says, you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. So Paul contrasts sonship with slavery. What does it mean to live like a son? Well, it means not to live like a slave. We can't conceive of our relationship with God as one of primarily servitude. Paul speaks that way. Jesus will speak that way. It's not that that idea is off the table, but what Paul is emphasizing here is that the son operates in relationship with the father differently than the slave does. A slave's relationship with the master of the house, with the father of the house, is determined entirely by his utility and usefulness and worth. The slave is always asking, what can I do for you so that you will take care of me? There's no trust. There's no love. It's all duty and obligation and proving my worth. Are you trying to prove your worth to the Father? Are you trying to prove yourself useful to Him? A son doesn't have to do that. A slave does. The plan of the prodigal son as he returns to his father's estate it illustrates this mindset perfectly. Because he said, he thought to himself, while he was yet in the far country, this is my plan. I'm going to go back home and I'm going to tell my father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. The, the prodigal son knows his father is good, knows his father is merciful, but he cannot conceive that the father still views him as a son. So the son comes back and says, I want to prove to the father that I'm still useful. That I'm worthy in some way to be in his house. And like the prodigal, the driving motivation of the slave is fear. Fear of being cast out. Fear of being shunned. Of shamed. Being pushed away. So because 
The slave's approach to the father is based on this fear of not being accepted and of needing to, he therefore needs to prove his worthiness. He needs to prove he belongs. But this isn't what the Holy Spirit is given to us for. The Holy Spirit is given to us to testify that we are children of God, that we are sons of God, with a co-equal standing before the Father as Jesus our Savior. And so we are to approach God as sons with the assumption that we belong. Sam doesn't have to prove to me he belongs in my house. I know why he belongs in my house. Yeah, as sons, we all mess up. Our dads have to push us. Our dads have to discipline us. Sometimes, because of our own sin and stubbornness, Hard lines have to be drawn and boundaries have to be set. But in a Christian household, and even more so in the household of the Father, you always belong. You don't have to prove you're worthy to be there. You don't have to pay rent on your room. Through the Holy Spirit, we have immediate and direct access to the throne room of God. Even in our deepest and darkest moments, we belong at God's table. He inclines his ear to us. That means he bends down to hear what we're saying. And he wants to comfort us in our distress. This is why Paul goes to the cry, Abba, Father. Why does he mention it? Both here and he mentions it in Galatians 4, 6, where he also talks about sonship. And in both places, the cry, Abba, Father, is closely linked to seeking the Father's help in our desperation. Do you know the only place that we see Abba, Father, in the New Testament besides Galatians 4 and Romans 8? In the Garden of Gethsemane. In Mark 14, 36. And going a little farther, Jesus fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Friends, the cry, Abba, Father, is not just saying, Daddy, Daddy. It's not just being able to call God Father. Being able to cry by the Spirit, Abba, Father, is being able to reach out to God in your lowest moment and know He hears you. To know He's there for you. It's it's to cry out, help me, Daddy, I'm drowning. And to know He's going to reach in and pull you out. That's what it means to cry, Abba, Father. And so, one of the ways that we live out our adoption as sons, as we live out our sonship, is that when we are broken, we don't hold ourselves back from God. When we're at our end, when we're at the end of ourselves, we don't try to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and make ourselves useful to God and get our life right so that God will pay us attention and bless us again. That's the mindset of a slave. That's the mindset of the prodigal. Through the Holy Spirit, when we're at our wit's end, in our most deep, our most embarrassing need, We cry out, Dad, I need your help. And know that he wants to hear us. And he'll come to our aid. He'll run to you.
All you have to do is cry. Second, we are adopted as heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, Paul says. Now, we've already mentioned this briefly in Paul's use of sonship language and the concept of inheritance. But because we are united with Christ, we receive all the benefits and blessings and rewards that are his because of his sonship and his obedience. We inherit from God through Christ, the Son of God. Now, what is the nature of this inheritance? What are we inheriting? We can speak broadly. We can speak in terms, general terms, that that God had promised to give the nations to Abraham as his inheritance. We can speak broadly and generally of Christ inheriting the world by virtue of his obedience and resurrection. But here's here's the interesting thing that I found. It's actually quite hard to find a specific referent behind this statement that we're heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. I did a, a word study, search, and there is not a single explicit passage in either the New Testament or the Old Testament that tells us what the Messiah is supposed to inherit. Not a single one. Usually Paul has something specific in mind when he makes big statements. Now, what is the point here? I think think it means that Paul's main thrust is not about what we are going to inherit. It's the fact that we are inheritors that we are written into God's will. We have the status of heirs as God's children. Remember what I said earlier about how women could not inherit the father's estate in the Roman world? Likewise, it was common practice for people to adopt um, well-equipped you know, successful individuals, adopt them into their household and give them a great deal of opportunity and privilege, but their inheritance would only go to their biological children. Right? It's conceivable that you could be adopted into a family and be left out of the will. But that's not what God the Father has done, Paul says. God has adopted you as a son, and in that, because you're in Christ, he has written you into the will. He's given you a share of the estate. In Christ, we are not only sons, we are heirs. Heirs of the world. Heirs of eternal life, of resurrection life. And so everything that is coming to Jesus on account of his obedience to the Father, it's coming to you and me as well. Whatever Jesus deserves in the new heavens and new earth, you're getting that too. Not because you deserve it, but because you've been adopted and put on that will. Because your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. But there's one big caveat here. There's a provisio, if you want the legal word. Paul writes, provided we suffer with him in order that we may be glorified with him. Paul writes, in order to inherit earth with Christ, we must suffer on earth with Christ. In order to inherit the earth with Christ, we must suffer on the earth with Christ. This is the great principle that was described by Martin Luther as a theology of the cross. It's the same principle that would be reiterated by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. So at the beginning, in in numero one of the 95 theses, Martin Luther wrote, when the Lord Jesus said, repent, he willed that the entirety of the Christian life be one of repentance. Dietrich Bonhoeffer 
wrote, when the Lord, Lord Jesus bids us come to himself, he bids us come and die. He bids us come and die. The apostle Peter writes in 1 Peter 4, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a, quote, Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God under that name. Friends, this is a massive principle of the Christian life. And being a son of God with Christ, the son of God. And a great many so-called Christians want nothing to do with it. A great many people want victory in Christ. They want health in Christ. They want wealth in Christ. They want success in Christ. They want good and happy and fruitful families in Christ, but they want nothing of the path of the cross. They want to leverage their supposed identity as God's sons and daughters for all the toys and wealth of this present age And like the prodigal, they want their inheritance now so that they can spend it as they please. But Christian, if we want to experience the glory and inheritance of the Son, if we want treasures in heaven, then we must embrace the grief and suffering of the Son. If we would wear the unfading crown of glory, we must also endure the painful crown of thorns. In order to inherit with Christ, we must suffer with Christ. And so our cross must come before our crown, just as Christ's cross came before his crown. And so I hate to break it to you, but if you have come to Christ thinking he will make my life better, then you're sorely mistaken. Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And so the question I have for you is, if following Jesus doesn't mean your life gets better, If following Jesus means your marriage doesn't improve, if following Jesus means your health continues to decline, will you still follow Jesus? Because if following Jesus, if you're following Jesus for the good things he can give you in this life, then all you're doing is using Jesus as a means to an end. So that brings us now to the question, what does Jesus adopt us for? What's our role in this family? What's our role in the family business? So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put the death, the deeds of the body, you will live. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may be glorified with him. In 1 John 3, the apostle writes... Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. But the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. What was Jesus' mission on earth as God's Son? Well, John tells us it wasn't 
quite to build a kingdom. It wasn't to make his name great. It wasn't to achieve power and glory. No, the Son of God came to earth to suffer and to die to sin. And through that to destroy the works of the devil. So, if we are now adopted as sons of God on earth, what is our mission in life? It is to suffer and to die to sin and to destroy the works of the devil. So Paul will say, God will soon crush Satan under your feet, applying Genesis 3.15 to the Christian church. It says, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Are, are we to build a kingdom in this world? Well, we're to be a part of building Christ's kingdom. But how does, how does Christ build his kingdom in the present age? It's through suffering and death. Yes, Christ is victor over all, and the kingdom of God is now advancing. But it's advancing by destroying the works of the devil. Paul writes, we're not debtors to the flesh. We owe the flesh nothing. Quite the opposite. In the spirit, Paul says, we are obligated as sons of God to put to death the sins of the body. Sonship means killing sin. And as Owen said, John Owen, you must be killing sin or sin will be killing you. So our adoption into the family of God sets before us a most serious business. And that business is murdering sin. We are to be in the business of crushing the heads of the serpent. We are to be in the business of uprooting the polluted, rotten fruit and influence of sin in this world. And we are to begin in our own life. We have some men in the congregation that are thinking about seminary. Maybe one day, some of you young folks, the Lord might call you into some sort of ministry labors. Maybe to be elders and deacons. But hear what the Apostle Paul is saying today to you. If you would do great things for the kingdom of God... First, you got to know what the business of being a son is. And it's to get your own house in order. It's to start with your own heart. It's to develop Christian character in yourself. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Part of my job as a pastor is to be a partner with God's Spirit and destroying the works of the devil in your life. It's a heavy duty. It's a messy duty. But it's sonship duty. We're not to show sin mercy, sin is to be killed. Outright, Derek Thomas writes, sin is not to be coddled or tolerated. It's not to be toyed with. It's our most deadly enemy, and it is the root cause behind all of the personal evil we see in the world around us. So how do we kill sin? Three ways. First, we kill sin by cutting it off. We kill sin by cutting it off. Jesus speaks of this radical amputation in Matthew 5, 29 through 30. He says, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Jesus t isn't telling us to physically mutilate the body. Plenty of people have done that throughout history, and they just found themselves missing a body part, and it hasn't helped with anything. Rather, Jesus is telling us that we need to be deadly serious with cutting off every opportunity for sin. 
This looks like not going to places that serve alcohol if you're a recovering alcoholic. It means putting on filtration and accountability software on your computer and digital devices if you're struggling with pornography. Even to totally eliminate your cable package and your internet package if you're too smart and you can get around those programs. Yes, that's inconveniencing, but Jesus says cut off a hand. It looks like leaving your job if that job turns out to be unethical and you're being pulled into unethical behavior that violates your conscience. The biblical principle is not that we become strong enough to resist in the face of temptation. When we're first battling a habitual besetting sin, that's usually what we do. Lord, I'm not going to change anything about my life, but I pray that you would give me the strength to resist pornography. That you would give me the strength to resist alcohol, whatever it is. Rather, the biblical principle is that we cut off the opportunity for temptation and then we develop the strength. Because sin saps our strength. Second, we kill sin by confessing it. In Ephesians 4, Paul speaks of exposing the shameful works of darkness. I'm not talking merely about establishing accountability relationships, though those can be helpful in the right place. What I mean by confessing our sin and exposing sin is that we stop hiding our sin. You stop hiding your shame. Sin is like a black mold that grows in the darkness. It doesn't matter how many times you clean that closet, clean under that cabinet, how much bleach you use, it's going to come back as long as it stays dark. You've got to expose it to the sunlight. You've got to expose your sin to the light of the sun. And that means you confess your sin not only to God, You confess your sin to human beings in whom the light of Christ shines. If you want Jesus to shine into your sin and your shame, you have to expose it to people who know the light and love and grace and healing of Jesus. That means you tell someone that you're struggling. Third, and finally, we kill sin by digging up the roots of our sin and planting them firmly in Jesus. It's easy for us to focus on the bad fruit, on the rotten apples and the the mushy bananas of the spiritual life, on the wormy figs. But there's a reason the fruit is going bad before it ripens. It's because the roots are not getting the nourishment that they need. They're planted in the wrong place. Jesus says, abide in me and I in you. I am the vine, you are the branches. So where are we supposed to be drawing our strength in life? Where are we supposed to be relying to produce fruit in life? It's it's in Jesus. And underneath every fruit sin, every bad apple that you've got in your life, There is a root that you are trying to satisfy outside of Christ. There's a hole that you're trying to fill outside of Christ. For my people have committed two evils, Jeremiah writes. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Every one of us has an injury, a wound, a trauma. Every one of us has a loneliness, a shame, a craving, a fear, a need that lies underneath our besetting sins. 
And what we are doing is we have let our roots sink into this broken, polluted cistern, this well, to fill that need, to heal that injury. And as long as we're drawing strength in that place, if that's the only place we know to fill our thirst, we're going to keep committing the same habitual sins over and over and over again. What we have to do is intentionally and painfully dig up those roots and intentionally plant them in Jesus Christ and draw our grace, draw our comfort, draw our healing and security from his spiritual resources rather than our own. So friend, what sin, or I'll say it this way, what need is your sin trying to satisfy? What wound is your sin trying to make up for? Jesus can satisfy that need. In fact, the only lasting solution, the only fountain that is pure and clear is the fountain of Jesus Christ through the Spirit. So as, uh, as we conclude, I need to ask you, friend, are you living like a son of God? Are you living in the confidence that God loves you, God hears you, God accepts you, and that he's not out to get you. Do you know that the inheritance of the whole world and all the riches of heaven are coming to you? Do you know that to get there you have to embrace and endure suffering? And you have to die. And you have to die to sin. And are you seeking to plant yourself in Jesus?